Psalm 62 is a hymn about trusting God alone. And it's for the choir director. It says, according to Jonathan, a psalm of David. Verse 1. My soul waits in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. Do you ever wait in silence for God? You know, I was thinking about this. Uh, What are some things that we wait for? You know, I'll, I'll wait at the bank or the ATM for money. I'll wait in lines to see a movie, to be entertained. I'll wait at the restaurant to be served food. Um, if you've ever been to Walmart, you've done some serious waiting, I know. Uh, waiting for stuff, right? Well, compared to how much time we wait for money, food, entertainment, and stuff, how much time do we spend waiting in silence for God, for the Lord? It's pretty disturbing, isn't it? It's, uh, God is, is really graceful. We really serve a gracious God. and uh, he just, He's graceful. We need, to give time, we need to give God opportunity to speak uh, into us. We need to be like David and wait in silence. When we're praying, when we're talking to him, give him a chance to respond. Uh, sometimes he responds uh, to us. Sometimes he responds in his word. It's a written word, and, and uh, we need to give God opportunity for that. David says, my soul waits in silence for God only. From him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. You know, over time, David's army grew in number. It grew in skill. It grew in experience. And yet David still does not rely on them for victory. You know, no, David, he has seen God work against the odds in impossible ways time and time again. And David knows that God only will save him, that God only is his rock, his safe place to stand. David knows that there's no other stronghold, no refuge, no place of safety outside of God. Well, now David speaks to his enemies in verse 3. He says, How long will you assail a man that you may murder him, all of you, like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence? They have counseled only to thrust him down from his high position. They delight in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. Selah. Because of David's confidence in the Lord, he marveled at the attempt of some people to thrust him down. David calls him a tottering fence, a leaning wall, suggesting their weakness. Think about it. Like David, if you have God on your side, who could they possibly have? Sinful man? A fallen angel? Uh, turn with me to Romans 8.31. Paul, Paul talks about this. Romans chapter 8. We're going to look at verse 31. Romans 8, verse 31. Paul writes, What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how how will not he also with him freely give us all things? Who Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, he who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Like David, be confident in God. Make him your only stronghold, your only place of refuge. The one who you turn to in times of trouble, times of distress, times of exhaustion. With God on our side, who could prevail against us? No one. Nobody can. Well, David continues in verse 5 of Psalm 62. He says, My soul, wait in silence for God only, for my hope is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be shaken. On God, my salvation and my glory rests. The rock of my strength, the refuge, my refuge is in God. 
Trust in Him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. So David says that he will not be shaken because his salvation, his glory, rests on God alone. You know, do you put your trust in Social Security and company retirements, 401Ks, stock markets, real estate investments? These things aren't necessarily bad, but don't put your trust in them. Don't make them your place of refuge, your place of safety. All those things can be gone in an instant. David says, trust in Him, in God, at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is a refuge for us. Selah. Well, he continues in verse 9. He says, Men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. In the balances they go up. They are together lighter than breath. Do not trust in oppression and do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your heart upon them. Once God has spoken, twice I have heard this, that power belongs to God and loving kindness is yours, O Lord, for you recompense a man according to his work. If anything is awesome, anything great is going to happen in our lives, it's from God, it's from the Lord. These things come from the Lord alone. And have you ever noticed that it's easier to trust God in the bad times? And it's so easy to forget God in the good times. And that's when we fail. That's when we fall. 1 Corinthians 10.12 tells us, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he does, lest take heed that he does not fall. It's easy in the good times sometimes to put confidence in ourselves and our jobs and, and uh, walk away from the Lord. We need to put our trust in God at all times, bad times and good times. And God loves to hear from us. He loves for us to pour out our hearts to Him. God is a refuge for us. Go to that refuge. Don't stand alone in the storm. But also don't stand out in the sun either. When your refuge, your place of safety is right there waiting for you to come to Him. Like David, put your trust in God alone. Make Him your only refuge, your only strong tower, your only place of safety. Everything else is just a false sense of security. Rely on God alone. He won't let you down. He won't. Let's look at Psalm 63. Psalm 63 is a hymn about thirsting after God and expecting victory from God. David wrote this psalm in a time of his life when as king he was separated from the ark, from the formal place of worship, to a place in the wilderness. He was, he was ran off to the wilderness. And so, so David satisfies the longing of his soul for worship by praising God for his loyal love, even in the middle of his distress here. Superscription says a psalm of David when he was in the wilderness of Judah. Verse 1. O oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. That word's also translated early. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh yearns for you in dry and weary land where there is no water. So David compares this dry desert that he's in to his thirst for God. You know, what do, the, what do the doctors tell us in the summer when you're out in the heat? They say, stay hydrated, right? Don't wait until you're thirsty because it's already, you're already starting to feel the effects of dehydration. Well, David is separated from his normal place of worship. This place where that he would go to seek God, to pray, to refresh his spirit, his watering hole. He was, he was separated from that. And so he's feeling this thirst, this spiritual longing. But he's not going to wait until he gets back to that regular place. He's not going to wait for an easier time. He's not going to wait until he's spiritually dehydrated. No, David says, Oh God, you are my God. I shall seek you earnestly. I shall seek you early. Like David, don't wait until you feel the effects of lacking God. Seek Him early. Seek Him earnestly. 
And you'll be spiritually refreshed, spiritually healthy, spiritually ready for God to use in powerful and productive ways. Well, David continues in verse 2, he says, Thus I have seen you in the sanctuary to see your power and your glory because your loving kindness is better than life. My lips will praise you. So I will bless you as long as I live. I will lift up my hands in your name. My soul is satisfied as with morrow and fatness. And my mouth offers praises with joyful lips. Have you seen God in his sanctuary? Have you seen His glory, His power at work? Have you experienced God's loving kindness? If you have, then let your lips praise Him. Bless Him like David. Lift up your hands to God's name. Let your soul be satisfied. Let your mouth offer joyful praises to our Heavenly Father. We'll have that chance again at at the end. We'll, We'll do another song. David says in verse 6, When I remember you on my bed, I meditate on you in the night watches. For you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. My soul clings to you. Your right hand upholds me. Have you ever laid awake at night? You just can't get back to, you can't go to sleep, or maybe you wake up in the middle of the night and you, you can't get back to sleep. Well, when David lies awake in his bed, he meditates on the Lord. He remembers how God helped him in the past, how God has protected and covered him with his wings. And what's the outcome of thinking about God and what he has done? Well, David sings for joy. He clings to God. God's right hand upholds him. So next time you can't sleep, try this. Think about what God has done in your life and talk to Him. Praise Him. Lift Him up. Lift your hands up to the Lord. Well, David turns to his present situation and speaks of his enemies in verse 9. He says, But those who who seek my life to destroy it will go down to the depths of the earth. They will be delivered over to the power of the sword. They will be a prey for foxes. So because God is on David's side, and David is on God's side. David assumes that those who are against him are against God. And so he kind of proclaims this bleak outcome for them. Well, David again tells the results of his victory before it even happens. In verse 11, he says, But the king will rejoice in God. Everyone who swears by him will glory, for the mouths of those who speak lies will be stopped. David and those that are loyal to God will rejoice in God, giving him the glory for the victory. Praising God is a byproduct of God's work in our lives. When we see God working, God's love in our lives, how else can we respond except by praising him for who he is and what he's done? Psalm 64. Psalm 64 is a hymn about the plots of men and the rescues of God. For the choir director, it's a psalm of David again. Verse 1, Hear my voice, O God, in my complaint. Preserve my life from dread of the enemy. Hide me from the secret counsel of evildoers, from the tumult of those who do iniquity, who have sharpened their tongues like a sword. They aimed bitter speech as their arrow to shoot from from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They hold fast to themselves in an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly. They say, who can see them? They devise injustices saying, we are ready with a well-conceived plot for their inward thought and their heart and the heart of man are deep. Deep are man's evil plots. Men will go to great lengths planning and plotting evil deeds. The wicked, they will encourage each other in evil matters. Someone will throw out a foolish idea and others will jump in encouraging them in it until they think they have a foolproof plan. Well, David recognizes that he has enemies. 
And that these enemies are serious in their plots against him. And so what does David do? In verse 1, he says, Hear my voice, O God. David brings it to the Lord again and again and over again. Do you see a pattern here? You know, I could be mistaken, but I think, I think God's trying to tell us something here. I think he's trying to get a point across. And what's that point? What is God trying to tell us? God is saying, I've got the power. I've got the authority. I've got the resources. I've got everything you need. And then some. Just ask. Just ask. Like David does. Just ask him for it. Over and over, we see David asking God and God faithfully meeting his needs, faithfully giving him victory. God will faithfully meet our needs too if we just ask him, if we just ask. So because David takes it to the Lord, he feels confident enough to declare what the outcome will be. And he does that in verse 7. He says, but God will shoot at them with an arrow. Suddenly they will be wounded so that they will make him stumble. Their own tongue is against them. All who see them will shake the head. Then all mere men will fear and they will declare the work of God and will consider what he has done. The righteous man will be glad in the Lord and will take refuge in him and all the upright in heart will glory. David is so confident in the Lord, so confident in what the Lord is going to do, and so confident that this work of God will inspire the righteous to be glad in the Lord and to glorify God. You know, David seeks no glory. This is a real sign of maturity. David doesn't seek the glory so people, or seek the victory so people will glorify Israel or glorify the king of Israel. No, David seeks the victory so God will be respected, so God will be feared by all men, so God will get the glory. David knows God is responsible and deserves all the glory, and so he gives it to him. And we should too. Well, Psalm 65. Psalm 65 is a song about dwelling with God, anticipating his deeds, and then describing his provision. It's for the choir director. It's a psalm of David, a song, it says in verse 1. There will be silence before you and praise in Zion, O God, and to you the vow will be performed. O you who hear prayer, to you all men come. Iniquities prevail against me. As for our transgressions, you forgive them. How blessed is the one whom you choose and bring near to you to dwell in your courts. We will be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. Oh, to dwell with the Lord. You know, David was a wise man. Although he lived under the law, he understood that the law did not save him. But it it was a picture of man's need to be saved. David sees that, and we see that here. You know, Paul writes something similar to this to the church in Ephesus. If you would turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 1, we're going to start in verse 3. And Paul's writing, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved, in him who we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. You have been chosen by God. 
David says God chose us to bring us near to him, to dwell in his courts, and that, that we would be satisfied with the goodness of God's house, with his holy temple. Paul says the same thing in different words. He says, we were chosen by God to be adopted as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us. We were chosen by God, each one of us. Verse 5, back in uh, Psalm 65, David continues, By awesome deeds you answer us in righteousness, O God of our salvation, you who are the thrust of all the ends of the earth and are the far and of the farthest sea, who established the mountains by his strength, being girded with might, who stills the roaring of the seas, the roaring of the waves, and the tumult of the peoples. They who dwell in the ends of the earth stand in awe of your signs. You make the dawn and the sunset shout for joy. So David declares the awesome deeds of God, his trustworthiness, his might, his strength, his power over the seas. People stand in awe of his creation. Have you ever sat and watched a sunset or a sunrise? It's beautiful, isn't it? The colors, the way the, you know, the, the, way the earth rotates and as it revolves around the sun, the, the perfect placement of everything enables that, enables that beauty. God just designed everything to work flawlessly. And this creation, it inspires awe of the Creator. David tells us that. Now David continues by describing God's provision in verse 9. He says, you visit the earth and cause it to overflow. That means in a good way. You greatly enrich it. The streams of God is full of water. You prepare their grain For thus you prepare the earth. You water its furrows abundantly. You settle its ridges. You soften it with showers. You bless its growth. You have crowned the year with your bounty and your paths drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip and the hills gird themselves with rejoicing. The meadows are clothed with flocks and the valleys are covered with grain. They shout for joy. Yes, they sing. What, God's, what God provides is never going to run out. There's no end to his provision. You know, Jesus talks about the provision of God. And let's, let's look at that in Matthew uh, chapter 6. Turn with me there. We'll, we'll close with this passage. Matthew chapter 6. We're going to look at verse 25. Matthew 6.25. This is Jesus speaking and he says, For this reason I say to you, do not be worried about your life as to what you will eat or what you will drink, nor for your body as to what you will put on it. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air that they do not sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not worth much more than they? And who of you being worried can add a single hour to his life? And why are you worried about clothing? Observe how the lilies of the field grow. They do not toil, nor do they spin. Spin. Yet I say to you that not even Solomon in all his glory clothed himself like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which is alive today, and tomorrow is thrown into the furnace, will he not much more clothe you? You have little faith. Do not worry then, saying, what will we eat, or what will we drink, or what will we wear for clothing? For the Gentiles eagerly seek all of these things. For your heavenly Father knows that you need all of these things. But seek ye first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. God's provision. God provides. He's a provider. If we seek him and ask him, he will provide for us. Would you pray with me? Oh, Father, we just thank you so much for your provision, for providing for us. We thank you for providing this place for us to meet. We thank you for for providing everything in each one of our lives, Lord. 
And we ask there's some here that, that are out of work, Lord, and we ask that you provide for them. One, you provided a job uh, just this week, and we praise you for that, Lord. And for the others that are seeking work, we ask that you provide for them too, Lord. And until you provide that job, we ask that you continue to provide for their daily needs, Lord, like you've promised. Help us to seek you first. Help us to seek your kingdom, your righteousness, Lord. This week I ask, Father, that we would talk to you, Lord, that we would talk to you, that we would seek you ahead of time, Lord, that you would remind us to talk to you, to pray to you, to ask you for that strength, Lord, and that you would just give us victory this week, Lord, victory over our flesh, victory over the the flesh that we struggle with, Lord. We all have struggles, each one of us, Lord, and I ask that you would give us victory, that you would remind us to daily rely upon you, to seek you, to make you our refuge like David does, like he does over and over and over again. It's not a one-time thing, Lord. It's a daily, an hourly thing. We need to make you our refuge. And we, we just ask that you would give us the strength to do that. Help us, Lord, help us. We need your help. Empower us this week, Lord, to do your will, to hear your words and to follow, to put them into practice to be your light and your truth to the world, Lord, that people would see you in us and that we would grow your kingdom, Lord, that we would make disciples in your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.